The other day we took its swedge blocks and I mentioned this anvil block. This is sort of like a swedge block, sort of like a little anvil, but it's just two big hardy holes in a great big block. I don't know what this actually weighs, but it's pretty close to 30 pounds probably. And it has a one inch hole and an inch and three eighths hole in it. And most people will use the one inch hole for their hardy tools because most anvils have a one inch hardy hole. And the inch and three eighths tool is good for making square shanks and upsetting heads on top tools like top fullers and flatters, things of that sort. But for my anvil, this inch and three eighths hole is just a little bit oversized for my hardy hole and it really is going to be ideal for me to make hardy tools for my bigger anvil. I'm not sure that I would call it an anvil block because one of the things I'm going to show you today is what I typically refer to as an anvil block and the two are completely different. So the uh, guy that I bought this from sells it as an anvil block. I guess that's what we'll call it. But I'll show you something that I usually call an anvil block because I don't know what else I'd call this. It's sort of a swedge block. It's sort of an anvil. So I guess it's sort of an anvil block. Anyways, it's got two holes in it. It's four inches tall. It's good and heavy. It's going to take some abuse. You can upset stuff in it very nicely and we're going to show you how to do that. When somebody saw it the other day on the swedge block video, they noted that it looked like it might move around a little bit and suggested mounting a hardy stem to it. That would be one option, however that would remove a lot of its versatility if you made it only fit your anvil or only fit one of the holes on your swedge block or something like that. This would fit under my hydraulic press. I'd have to take my die holders off and maybe make a special holder that this set in so it stays put and center whichever hole I want under the ram of the hydraulic press, but that would be an outstanding way to do tools like this, so I may do that. This would sit on the table of the fly press very nicely. If you had a bigger power hammer than what I have, with bigger dies, the, the hammer doesn't care, but my dies are smaller than this, so it would be hard for me to make a, a holder that would hold this and keep it from bouncing off the power hammer. But if you've got a great big power hammer, I'll bet you you could adapt this with a holder so that you don't have to modify the block. You just make a holder that it dro drops in and clamps to so it stays put on your hammer dies, and it would be wonderful. So far, I've only used this on, sitting on my big swedge block, and it didn't really need to be anchored down. It worked perfectly just sitting there. It's heavy enough and solid enough that it just wasn't a problem. But to mount it to the anvil, the guy that sells these, by the way, his name is Bob Menard, and he runs Ball and Chain Forge, and I believe he's still got these things for sale as far as I can tell. I don't have uh, any way to connect you to order, so go to ballandchainforge.com, and you'll have to send him an email. I couldn't find any way to order it directly, but I sent him an email. He said, mail me a check. He mailed me an anvil block, and we're in good shape. But he thought with how to anchor this to the anvil. And he just makes this little clamping ring that goes right along with it. And the chains go to the horn and to the tail of the anvil. And it's got some bars to clamp to and that will keep it in place and you don't have to chase it around. It's not going to fall on the floor or fall on your foot. And my guess is that you could probably adapt these just fine through the holes on a swedge block that's got a lot of holes and probably get the thing to stay perfectly still if you're doing a big production run. For one hardy sitting on the swedge block, I'm not worried about it. If it moves around, it's not going to fall on the floor. On the anvil, I'd want it solid because my anvil is only about as wide as this and it wouldn't take much to knock it off. So let's go put this on the anvil and see what it looks like mounted to the anvil. Very simply, that just sits right over the most solid part of the anvil. This is one of the things that makes it so nice instead of working over the hardy hole. And then it's got these bars that you just clamp up underneath here. Really a very simple operation. And 
this would probably be easily adaptable if you have a striking anvil that's at a little lower height which would probably actually be better it'd be easy to mount this to the striking anvil that's nice and solid and it's not going anywhere well I did it again I forgot to turn the microphone on when I started forging this this is a two inch square piece of bar that I had reduced the shank down to close to size under the power hammer it's never quite a perfect fit it's hard to create a perfect shoulder of the power hammer so putting it in the anvil block and upsetting it creates that perfect shoulder it's really quite a, a nice way to do this it also spreads the material out and gives me a little bit larger block this block will be what I refer to as an anvil block and is just a supplemental forging surface at the anvil it is important to make sure that you don't get the shank too long if it goes all the way through the anvil block while you're upsetting you're going to actually end up upsetting the end of the shank into the anvil block and you may not get it back out again hopefully when it cools it will contract and you'll be able to get it out this is really going quite quickly there's so much good support right there at the center of the anvil that's really the the sweet spot to work and is way better than working over the the tail which would be a little bit bouncy and could damage your anvil if you turn it 90 degrees every so often it'll go more even it'll make up for any irregularities in your your swing the one problem with this is it's kind of high between the four inches of extra height for the anvil block and a couple inches extra height for the piece I'm working plus a larger hammer yeah, I'm six to seven inches taller than I would like to be and it is not the most ergonomic way to forge but it is getting the job done and since I'm not going to do this all day long it will certainly work you can also see the chains have loosened up a little bit on the anvil block well let's get some real sound back working with a 14 pound sledge this is going pretty quick I may not need to go too many more heats with this. Now doing this under the power hammer or hydraulic press I would have a nice smooth surface now this would be an ideal place to have a striker but without one I just have to use a smaller hammer on the flatter and get rid of the glove on my hammer hand and that can smooth this up pretty nicely can even do a little rounding of the corners but now it's time to take this off and just go to the anvil directly so I want to make sure this is I want to make sure this is set to fit the hardy hole on my anvil and not the, the block necessarily great if those two things are the same but the fit on the anvil is the more important fit and if it's not a tool that always goes in the same way turn it all four sides to make sure that it fits in all four directions again a striker and a sledgehammer would be wonderful So 
that's it for that for now. I'm going to let it cool and then I'm going to probably do some more work on it later. Now this video is really about showing you that anvil block that I used to form the tenon for this and how you might be able to use that to your advantage. This anvil block, and we'll probably make another one of these at some point to discuss more what it's specifically for, but it's just a place when you're working at the anvil and you don't have a good edge or you've got something that hangs over both sides and you need a smaller surface, you just put a little riser in, which is an anvil block. And you've seen me use this welded up anvil block before. It's really the same thing. You can make these little anvil blocks with different radiuses for different purposes. And if you were making a top swedge, it'd be easy to turn this into a top swedge. I have more to do on it, but like I say, making this tool isn't really the point of the video. It was showing how to use that other tool. Now why don't we do all of this in the hardy hole of the anvil? That's what seems to make sense, but there's a couple of reasons not to do it that way. One is it's a little bit less efficient. Even though this is a big heavy anvil and it's solid and I can't perceive that it moves, there's always going to be a little more bounce at the tail or at the horn. And that means the hardy hole is not going to be as effective a surface to work on as the center of the anvil. You want that rebound from the center to help get the work accomplished. So working over the hardy hole just isn't quite as efficient. It's going to be a little bit springy and that just sucks the energy out of your work. You may not notice it, but the effect is there. The other reason is that it is absolutely possible to break the tail off your anvil if you work too hard. That's a 300 pound anvil. The odds of me doing that with any hammer I can swing are very slim. Probably won't happen. But if you're working in a 75 pound anvil and swinging a 10 pound sledgehammer, the odds go up. And on old wrought anvils that have a forge welded on steel face on a wrought iron body, that little bit of spring under a heavy sledgehammer and all that flex could cause that weld to come apart. And I have seen quite a few old anvils that have a split in the, the tool steel face right there and this part of it's missing. And that might be what it's from, is too much heavy hammering on the tail. So anytime you can avoid that really heavy work. So if you get your hardy shank shape just right and you just need to refine it, great. If you're trying to really upset a big tool in the hardy hole, there is a risk that you can damage your anvil. Working on that anvil block over the center of the anvil or on a separate support is much less likely to damage your anvil. Now I mentioned earlier that I had also used this just sitting on my swedge block. So let's make another little tool and it's a tool that we will use in a future video. I'm going to do a half penny scroll starter. And we probably won't finish that tool either. Again, this isn't about making those tools. It's about using the anvil block. Now we have looked at making hardy tools all at the anvil before. And since that's not the main goal of this video, I'm going to take this and start it at the power hammer and explain what I'm doing. You could certainly do all this by hand at the anvil.
So we stepped off material and left a very rough shoulder under the power hammer. And that's fairly typical for power hammer shoulders. Uh, nicer hammers, sometimes the dies line up better, but this is just the way mine goes. You saw me cut this off because it was too long. Unfortunately, it's still a little bit too long. I'm liable to drive that down into whatever's under here and upset the end. But on the swedge block, it doesn't matter. I'm going to work over this hole, and as long as this drops down in that hole, I'm not going to upset it. I can make this as long as I want to. You notice it doesn't fit all the way down. That's exactly what I want. I want this to define that final little bit of it. This is a little smaller, plus it's more ergonomic where it is. So I'm going to use a smaller sledgehammer, and I don't have to work quite so hard. It does bounce around a little bit. Yes, it's inefficient. And yes, I could find a way to clamp it down. But this is going to take so little work, it doesn't matter that much. So we're getting a much cleaner shoulder already. I think that's probably all we need to go. I'm going to refine this top side a little bit. And then I can make the tool out of it. My anvil does not have a one inch hardy hole, but I have this little adapter. It's just a piece of one inch ID square tubing, so it's probably inch and a quarter, eighth inch wall tubing. And I can use that at this anvil. Although, to be perfectly honest with you, I've already got one of these started that fits the inch and a quarter hardy hole, and I'll use that later. So I'll probably sell this one when it's done. It's not done yet. It'll need to be hardened, tempered, ground, all that kind of stuff. I'm 
just refining the top surface a little bit so I have less grinding to do. But other than that, I'm pretty much done with what I'm going to do on this right now. Everything else will be done at the grinder and then hardened and tempered. So that's a, a half penny scroll starter and I will explain exactly what we do with this when we do a half penny scroll. So that is just a quick look at this tool that Ball and Chain Forge sells as an anvil block. It is a useful tool for making hardy tools that will fit in your anvil. Now the two tools that I worked on today were just kind of crude examples. Both are going to get refined and finished. I'll spend more time with them. But this video was not about those tools as much as it was about this tool. And I just wanted to introduce it. If it's something you're interested in, you can explore the possibilities and figure out the best way to secure this in your shop. My plan is actually to make another swedge block stand that will hold all three of these blocks. And I'm going to make that stand tiered so that, each, that all of these will be level in the end. So it will be one level surface and you don't have to worry about hitting the corner of this block if you're working in this block. And it will have places for these two blocks to stand up on edge so that you can work on any of the edge profiles. But that may be a while before I get around to it. So it's a useful tool. I'm going to be really glad I bought it. Contact Bob if you're looking for one. It's, uh, again, Ball and Chain Forge. And no, he didn't pay me to present this tool. He didn't send me the block for free. I bought the block, paid the shipping, just like you will. Same price that you'll get it for. And it's worth checking it out and talking to him. I don't know if the price is still the same a month or two from now when you might see this video, so I'm not going to quote prices on the video. You'll have to contact him to get the price. Another place you can find some information to do similar things is on Mark Asprey's channel. He has made some bottom tools, and he's actually the one I found this block from on one of his videos, but he will discuss, and I think in one of his books he discusses making a very similar tool by drilling and chiseling out the square slot and a piece of heavy plate and how to weld it up into a tall structure that will do exactly what this will do, how to mount it, do all that stuff. So if you want to make something like this, Mark goes through all that for you. I don't think I'm going to bother to go through and make one based on those instructions because this is so useful. I'm not sure I'm going to need another one except maybe under the power hammer because like I say, this won't actually fit under my power hammer. The It'll actually, it fits under the dies fine, it just is too big for the dies and I'd have to come up with a really weird clamping thing and I just don't think that's the best plan. What I am going to try and do is I found this piece of monstrous tubing, it's 4140, so it's hardenable chrome moly steel that will make an excellent tool and I think that I can cut a section of this off that's the right height, I can get three tools out of this and I can square this up under the power hammer and that should square up the hole which will then need to be drifted. It's going to be a long process. This might be a whole day of squaring, drifting, squaring, drifting and who knows how much filing and grinding afterwards to make it all work right. But I think I can make an excellent tool that with a long handle on it I can hand hold under the power hammer. I can tip it if I need to adjust corners down and I'll be able to take it from the power hammer to the swedge block, turn it upside down, and knock the, the tool out if it doesn't just fall out on its own. It should fall out on its own, but if it doesn't, having a handheld tool instead of one anchored to the hammer will probably actually be a, a better solution. And that tool could then be used in the treadle hammer. It could also be used at the anvil. It could be taken to somebody else's shop and used there if I were going to a workshop. So I hope that works. And I may try to do a video on this, but like I say, I'm afraid it's going to be about an eight-hour job to make those tools. It's going to be a lot of work, and it might be easier to have somebody make something like this in a handheld version that has a, uh, a way to cast it or water jet it. But 
that sounded like an interesting way to go, and I'll want to see if it works. So we're, we're going to do that at some point. And I'll at least share the tool with you, even if I can't do a video that's worth watching of all the fiddling and back and forth. And that'll certainly be a power hammer video. Another way you could get a similar tool is simply to weld up bars. If you need a one inch, you use a couple of one inch bars on the side, a couple of big flat plates on the other side. It may not be as good. Eventually the welds are probably going to fail. It's a lot of stress on, on the welds like that. Now we talked about swedge blocks the other day. And in talking about swedge blocks, um, somebody sent a link to the Salt Fork Craftsman's website. And I'll try to put a link down in the comment section or in the description. And one across here to a block that they make that is very similar to this one here but it has a shovel form in it and that shovel form makes that a very useful block somebody asked which block would you have if you could only have one that would be tough because I like the shovel form of the little block but I like the bigger blocks their block has both and that's a pretty good deal and it's a pretty good price for a swedge block it's the same price I paid for this so it'd be worth checking out their website and looking at that so this video, I did a fair amount of work either beforehand under the power hammer. I didn't show the whole finished product. We're going to continue to do videos that are mostly start to finish, that show every step, and mostly by hand. But I'm not going to ignore the fact that I have power hammer, fly press, hydraulic press, and a treadle hammer in the shop. Those will show up in the videos from time to time. And we will probably do more videos that feature them prominently. I'm going to probably do some tongs that are done primarily under the power hammer just to show how that's done because I know some of you do have power hammers and some of you are hoping to buy power hammers so it's worth looking at some of these things to see how those things are done but most of the videos are still going to be by hand at the anvil because I know that a lot of the viewers only have the hand tools and probably don't even have a full size anvil yet. So we're going to keep it as simple as we can but we're going to try to explore all the possibilities. We're going to try and appeal to anybody that is blacksmithing and not just the, the newest blacksmiths. But if you're a new blacksmith stick around. We're going to do lots of, lots of good beginner projects. We're not going to forget you. We're not going to leave you behind and that'll still be the main goal of this channel is to bring the newer blacksmiths along until they are not new blacksmiths anymore. And then we'll start with a new crop of new blacksmiths. So we'll keep doing it. I've talked long enough. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was worthwhile. Love it if you'd give it a thumbs up. Love it if you'd hit that subscribe button. Then get out to your shop. Make something. But stay safe. Wear your safety glasses. And we'll see you for the next one.